Testing. Hey everybody, welcome back to You Are Not Broken. I had an amazing week. Did a live book signing of the You Are Not Broken, Stop Shooting All Over Your Sex Life book in my hometown of Bellingham. And it's super humbling to do it in front of my hometown community sold out event, which was awesome. So that's what I've been up to. Um, next week, we're probably going to hit a million total downloads on this podcast, which is awesome. So thanks to everybody who's listened. Share it this week so we can get to the mi million. Then you can see me post about the million. Um, it's a pretty big deal. I don't know. I haven't Googled how many podcasts actually make it to a total million download, but I'm pretty excited. So today I wanted to do, I get so many questions on Instagram about hormones and I do not answer them all because <laughs> I can't. Um, and this is never for individual personal medical advice, that either. See your doctor. Um, but so many questions about estrogen that I thought I would do a podcast. And I have so far, I have seven. Let's see if any come up while I am podcasting. But seven um, need to know facts or things about hormones. So I thought I would start with that because so many women, they're like, they come into this hormone thing and, and they don't know who to believe and their doctor might not know a lot. And... Um, I actually, for those who don't know, I got into hormones and menopause hormone replacement therapy because of sex, because of the podcast, because of my Instagram listeners, because women just kept being like, yeah, but what about menopause? What about sex life and menopause? What about sex life and menopause? Um, so maybe I'll actually make that number one <laughs> on my thing today, and then we'll have eight total. Um, so sex and menopause is the reason why. I got into menopause and got menopause certified by NAMS, North American Menopause Society. Go to menopause.org, put in your zip code to find a menopause um, practitioner near you if you want help with this. So most of us, if we're lucky, will live past age 51, which is the average age of menopause in America. Everybody needs to know about this. Even, even you 20-year-olds listening to this podcast, um, God bless you for listening. But like this should happen to you too. And so many people in their 50s, etc., are like, nobody ever told me. My mom never told me, you know, all this stuff. My doctor doesn't believe in hormones, all these things. And it's like the more we just everybody, the the men, the non-ovary bearing people, the 20 year olds, the more people talk about it, the less shameful it is, the more help people can get, the more it's real. Right. Um, just because something's natural doesn't mean you don't suffer from it. Uh, and we'll get into that because I think that's like number five on my thing. Um, but so many people being like, it's natural, so just deal. It's like, well, so is breaking your femur by falling and dry eyes and uh, urinary tract infections and all the other things that we say are natural, but we help people with. So let's rethink what we mean when we shame people with natural. But I'm getting ahead of myself because that's like number five. So here are, in no particular order, Eight things off the top of my head I think that people should know about hormones. Um, again, this is not individual medical advice for you. See your own doctor if you want more help. But number one, sex and menopause. It is not true that your sex life goes to shit after menopause. If you read the book by Peggy Kleinplatz, Magnificent Sex, you will find out that the magnificent sex people are not young. They're actually midlife uh, to older for various reasons. They're confident, they're accepting of their body, they're accepting of their partner, they know how to communicate, they dedicate time to it, they prioritize a good sex life, um, all the good things. So it's not true that sex goes down in menopause, but the two biggest determinants of sexual activity in a woman past menopause is, number one, Availability, I think in no particular order, but availability of partner. And number two is menopause uh, symptoms. And I always say, I can't help you with number one. <laughs> I'm not a dating service. But number two, if, if you're having hot flashes, night sweats, poor sleep, mood changes, joint aches and pains, um, all this stuff, you're probably less likely to be interested in sex. Dry vagina, uh, overactive bladder, urinary tract infections, all the things that increase postmenopause. So... In that way, treating those symptoms, usually with estrogen as menopause hormone therapy, will help those symptoms and therefore your sex life. 
So it's not true that estrogen uh, in everybody would increase a sex drive or helps people be more sexually active. There's very mixed data on that. But if you treat menopause hormone symptoms, that will help their that will help their sex life. So that's number one, sex and menopause. It is a myth that sex needs to stop or there's nothing you can do about it or that women after menopause have um, worse sex. They're actually in the magnificent sex category um, for various reasons. Number two, number two in the list of things I wish people knew about hormones is the difference between systemic and vaginal hormones. I say it over and over and over. I'll spend my I'll spend my life on Instagram talking about the difference between systemic and vaginal, as well as talking about um, what vaginal hormones are because people want, they don't know. So systemic means total body. Hormone replacement therapy tends to mean systemic therapy. This is in standard a cream or a patch only to confuse you by there is a systemic preparation that goes in the vagina as a vagina ring. It's called fem ring. Um, but otherwise, any sort of estrogen that you put in the vagina is localized, often called low dose vaginal estrogen. It can be in a cream, a ring called a uh, called um, estring for local or tabs called Uvafem in other countries or Vagifem in this country. The two creams are Premarin, which is brand name, um, and then Estradiol, which is the generic. Estrace would be the brand name of Estradiol. Um, that is made from yams in a factory. Premarin is pregnant mare's urine. Uh, I think they're pretty equivalent use-wise, but I, I tend to see Premarin be more expensive and then people not want to use pr Premarin because it's conjugated equine estrogens. Um, but I think safety on both of them, because they're vaginal low dose, they're not systemic, um, is equal. So estradiol, see um, my blog post or the previous podcast, I think it was January's live podcast where I talk about how to get vaginal estrogen cream. But real quick, um, you can go to getinterlude.com for vaginal estrogen cream. Um, you can transfer your prescription to the Amazon pharmacy or to Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drugs if your insurance is making you pay, say, more than like 40 or $50 for your vaginal estrogen. But I get off track. So systemic is full body. Vaginal is just your vagina. The an entire year's worth of vaginal estrogen is the equivalent to one pill of hormone replacement therapy. Um, but when most people talk about hormone replacement therapy, they're talking about systemic, right? You can be on both systemic hormone replacement therapy and vaginal hormone replacement therapy. Systemic hormone replacement therapy is still very low dose, very low dose. It's not, we're not nowhere near giving you your 25 year old estrogen back. Um, so it's, a lot of times it's not enough to treat the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, which is pelvic symptoms, which is best served by vaginal estrogen. Bladder and vagina share a wall. So you get the cream in your vagina, it helps your bladder out. That's how it works. Um, and again, systemic's not often enough. And we don't have great data that systemic will help a lot of the GSM, genital urinary syndrome of menopause stuff. Um, but we do have some data to say that systemic estrogen does help nocturia for all the nocturia people and um, urologists listening to this podcast or gynecologists or anybody prescribing. Here's the deal. Vaginal estrogen therapy, low dose, just helps the pelvis, doesn't go into your body. You can start that at any time. I start that on 85-year-olds. But systemic hormone therapy is um, both is most recommended in within 10 years of menopause transition. Average age of menopause is 51. That means 50% go sooner, 50% go after. So if you are 65 and your periods stop at 50, you are now not in the most opt optimal age range to start on hormones. I see these people a lot. These are our baby boomer folks and older Gen X folks who lived in the 20 plus years of estrogen kills you, estrogen gives you your cancer, blah, blah, blah. And now they're like, I still have hot flashes. This never ended. I'm worried about my bones. I'm worried about my brain. Can I start? It doesn't mean you can't start, but if you're 10 years 
past average age of menopause um, or your menopause, you already have sustained some cardiovascular changes. Uh, damage might be a too much of a loaded word, but changes that increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke by when you then start hormone replacement therapy. So you need an expert to really counsel you on the risks and benefits, and you have to be willing to accept that. You are in a higher risk category. And this is looking at data from the Women's Health Initiative and putting older women on hormones who have not been on hormones for over a decade. Uh, doesn't mean you can't, just means you have a higher risk and you must accept that higher risk. Uh, with vag Again, with vaginal estrogen, doesn't matter. Start it whenever. Start it when you're 72. Start it when you're 50. There's no age range because it's not systemic. So number two was the difference between systemic and vaginal estrogen. I hope I answered all the questions with that. With the differences, you can be on both. You can start the vaginal at any time. Vaginal is acceptable post-breast cancer. Um, there's the ACOD statement on that. There are two newer studies showing slightly increased risk of recurrence, but not overall mortality if you're on an um, aromatase inhibitor. I don't think that's going to change ACOG's guidelines. These are not randomized controlled trials. Um, but just, you know, for the Uber experts listening, uh, I'm following that data closely. As of right now, January 2023, if you've had breast cancer, you usually are not allowed to go back on systemic estrogen without being in the setting of a clinical trial. Um, I think that's going to change in the next 10 years. We currently have 5 million breast cancer survivors. Uh, number one killer of breast cancer survivors is heart disease, not breast cancer. So I think uh, they are getting loud and we should listen to them and we should care about their quality of life. But we're going to need more studies to be like, who is who is the right candidate? Is it only stage one and carcinoma in situ? Is it, uh, you know, is it estrogen positive? Is it not estrogen positive? Does it even matter? So I digress. Um, moving on. Otherwise, we're never going to finish. Number three, estrogen doesn't cause cancer. I'm just going to keep it short. And uh, there you go. Just kidding. So... Women's Health Initiative. This is uh, this is explained very well in the book Estrogen Matters. Um, it's also explained very well in a lot of my other podcasts of where this estrogen causes cancer came from. Um, estrogen does not cause cancer. Um, the Women's Health Initiative said it did, but that was only in the estrogen progestin arm, progesterone arm, and that was only because their placebo group was um, tainted by having previously taken estrogen which we now know estrogen actually decreases your risk of breast cancer. If you're taking estrogen and you get breast cancer, you have improved, uh, you have improved, I think it's mortality. I want to say it's improved, so decreased mortality compared to your compatriots who got breast cancer who hadn't previously been on estrogen, but the estrogen did not cause the breast cancer. Asterisks on that, we do have some concern that hormones can cause growth of an already existing cancer. This is why most people's rules are if you're on hormone replacement therapy, you need to be up to date on your mammograms because if, if there is anything there, we want to find it. We want to find it early. Uh, we don't want to ignore it. I just saw a woman literally this week, three months ago, she came to see me for severe hot flashes, severe quality of light, hot life hot flashes put her on estrogen and uh, progestin to protect your uterus. She came back. She said they're gone a hundred percent, a hundred percent better on estrogen. And I said, did you get your mammogram? She said, no. And I said, I will not refill these if you don't get your mammogram. You need a primary care doctor to get you a mammogram. Um, because if there's something little there, we want to know. We don't want to give her anything that's going to grow it. So that's it. Estrogen does not cause cancer. Alcohol increases your risk of breast cancer, um, adiposity, so elevated, um, not total body weight, but, but adipose tissue specifically increases your risk and uh, lack of physical activity increases your risk of breast cancer. So I always say we're scared of the wrong things, you guys. Let's get scared of the right things. Um, number three, estrogen also, staying on number three for a second, estrogen decreases the risk of colon cancer by about 30%. So 
estrogen, again, asterisks for the pros in the group, estrogen does increase your risk of uterine cancer, endometrial cancer, by uh, 5 to 10% above baseline risk. But we know that, and that's why there's the rule that if you take systemic estrogen, you have to be on a progestin um, to protect the uterus, which gets rid of any increased risk compared to baseline. So there you go. Number four, we gendered hormones and that hurts women. And what I mean by this is in med school, and I know they do this outside of med school, but in med school they say estrogen's the female hormone and testosterone's the male hormone. And um, that's not true. Women in, in their 20s, for example, when they have a lot of estrogen, at some points in their cycle still have more testosterone in their body than estrogen. We have a lot of testosterone. We have one-tenth the level of testosterone of men, but we still have a lot of testosterone. But what we did is we said that's the male hormone, estrogen is the female hormone. So we have very little data on the role of testosterone, number one, in, in people who have periods, but number two, post-menopause. And the role of testosterone on muscle mass, bone health, brain health, um, and sex drive. So right now we have enough data to say that testosterone supplementation post-menopause is indicated for low desire. You usually take it for three to six months. It's slow going. And if it doesn't help your, your sexual desire after that, then stop it because low testosterone wasn't the reason for your low desire. Remember, low desire, biopsychosocial. It's complex. It's not always spontaneous and that's okay. Um, but we don't have a lot of data <clears throat> because we gendered hormones and that hurts women. So we need, we need more. Um, there is a study, I just, somebody on Instagram, thank you so much for telling me, told me that in Australia, they are currently enrolling in a study looking at women and testosterone, I think for bone health. I think that's what it is. So keep me posted on what you're hearing about testosterone in women. Number five. Now, I said this on somebody else's podcast and I was just watching a clip from it and I thought it was, I thought what I said was brilliant. So I'm going to try to remember it and say it again in this number five. Natural is a weapon waged to keep us in place. Natural is a weapon waged against women to keep them in their place. Because like, how the hell do you argue with somebody who's like, yeah, but it's natural. You know, well, I argue with them to be like, yeah, and you're wearing shoes and you drove a car here and you brushed your teeth, none of which are natural. I have a water pick, which has been amazing for my gum health and it's not natural, let alone all the processed sugar we eat, which is not natural. Not, there's not much natural, you guys, anymore. I'm, I'm, I paused to try to think of what's natural. Um, but when we tell women to do X, Y, and Z or to stop doing X, Y, and Z because it's natural or because it's not natural. I think it's just a way, like I get, I get so cringy with natural now because like you literally can't stand in shoes and tell a woman to do something because it's natural because you're wearing shoes, which is not natural. We literally do everything in our lives to try to improve our lives, yet we throw natural on menopause like a weapon. And I, frankly, I'm sick of it. So here, so there you go, number five. Um, number six, pellets and compounded hormones are to be avoided if better options are available. I get this. I get this on the Instagram all the time of like, what about testosterone pellets? What do I think? Like, people don't know. People don't know two things. Number one, that testosterone is available, FDA approved, dirt cheap in a cream, uh, sorry, in a gel. Uh, you can get from your regular doctor as long as your doctor knows how to prescribe it and that it's safe and that it's indicated for low libido. Um, so you don't have to pay hundreds to hundreds of dollars and get a pellet injected in your butt and get a testosterone of 400, which is like an, an, a normal male range. Just saw a woman. She was transferring her care to me after getting pellets somewhere else. Her testosterone was like 380. I'm like, men would like a testosterone of 380, some of them. Um, so... Pellets and compounded are, can be super therapeutic, which means above what's been studied. So we don't know the risks. We have multiple paper, papers saying compounded uh, has higher side effects. Um, so therefore probably higher risks. And then it's also very expensive. If you go to just these hormone clinics where they wanna give you pellets and they're proprietary compounded X, Y, and Z, 
In case you haven't done the data, menopause lasts for like 30 years, if you're lucky, right? You gotta, this has to be cheap, you guys. This is, I am, I am not a proponent for women spending thousands and thousands of dollars on their hormones. Um, but I think it's just, it's the, the on the behalf of doctors, right? We suck at giving estrogen to women post-menopause, let alone testosterone. So people, they just want to feel better. It's not the women's fault. So they just go to these testosterone pellets and they do this for estrogen and progestin too. So I'm not harping on testosterone, but they get these pellets, they get these proprietary um, compound of medications, which either are super weak and they don't work or they're super high dose, they're not regulated. So if there are FDA approved products available, use them. Number one, they tend to be cheaper. Number two, insurance covers them. Not the testosterone one, but estrogen progestin. Um, it's just safer. Don't don't have a testosterone of 400 unless you want to transition, like that's fine. Um, but maybe you don't want acne, a permanently deepened voice and an enlarged clitoris that never goes back to its own size. Maybe, just saying. I'm trying. I'm trying my best to educate you and entertain you at the same time and hopefully make you laugh and or cry so you get a little pissed so we get better care for women in this freaking country. Number seven, you never need to stop your hormones. Current guidelines, which I have not done a podcast on yet, but I need to. They're a 2022 North American Menopause Society came out with updated guidelines on hormone replacement therapy. Um, you never need to stop. Basically, the statement is if the benefit continues to outweigh the risk for you, you don't need to stop. This is why you know I saw a woman, she came to see me from Florida, came to see me, I got her on hormones in the clinic. I'm like, you got to come here every year if I'm going to keep giving you hormones or get somebody in Florida to you know continue this prescription. So she contacted my office like this week. I was like, can I get a refill? I'm in Florida. I'm not going to, I'm not going to come up there. I'm like, no, because, because the benefit must outweigh the risk. And the only way to keep having that conversation is to check in with your doctor every year to be like, have you had blood clots? How's your cholesterol? Have you been getting your mammograms? Have you been getting your colonoscopies? You know, all the things. Are you, are you exercising? Are, you know, is it worth it? Are you becoming somebody who's still healthy enough to be on hormones? Um, and if the benefit out continues to outweigh the risks, you can stay on hormones until you die. This is all for systemic and vaginal. Um, please go back to number two if you're still confused on systemic versus vaginal. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't I tell you two things. Number one, how many people come in and they say, well, my doctor or my nurse practitioner just told me to stop because I was too old now. Like I, I hear that all the time. It's a fallacy that's not following guidelines. Number two, how many people I see as a urologist who come in, I kid you not, six months after their hormones were stopped by somebody. They come in with recurrent UTIs, pain with sex, new prolapse, new incontinence. All the genital urinary syndrome and menopause stuff is kicking in right about, and I'm like, have you ever, because I, I usually ask, like, have you ever been on hormones? And they're like, yeah, I was on blah, blah, blah until six months ago. And I'm like, yep, you're right on time. Welcome to my clinic. And this is what happens. And if they want to go back on hormones and they've only been off for about six months, it's it's usually perfectly safe to do so. They just had an uneducated provider tell them they were old enough and they needed to stop. And that's coming from the world, the Women's Health Initiative when they said as low a dose for as little as possible, which is not based on any data. Um, but the new data is you never need to stop your hormones. Number eight, the FDA will not help us. And this is flying in the face of number uh, six, where I said that FDA approved products are better, they're safer, they're more regulated, insurance covers them. And now I'm saying in number eight, the FDA is not here to help us, meaning it's gonna be a billion dollars to get a testosterone for women. And you can't, uh, you can't trade, what am I saying? Trademark, like patent, have on, have on brand, a testosterone, because testosterone is a natural occurring hormone in nature. So no pharmaceutical company can like claim it as their own. Um, so what pharmaceutical company who can't make money off of testosterone is going to go through a 1 billion FDA study for the safety and efficacy of testosterone in women. So don't hold your breath. Australia does have a testosterone in women for women. Again, women's testosterone one on average, one tenth the dose of male testosterone. We have um, good short-term safety data. We don't have long-term safety data. 
because, again, we gendered testosterone, so we didn't study it in women for the longest time. So the FDA is not helping us in the testosterone realm. The FDA is not helping us with estrogen being used as a preventative. So estrogen is FDA approved for the um, prevention of osteoporosis in high-risk individuals. But I don't see estrogen becoming, again, for the same stated reason, this stuff's generic and nobody's going to be making any money off of it. Um, but my biggest, like, aha on this, like, in the last couple of weeks was the renewed interest in the role of estrogen decreasing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Two-thirds of all people with Alzheimer's are female. The majority of people who take care of people with Alzheimer's are female. Women have a vested interest in decreasing this freaking disease, which is incurable and deadly. My grandma died of Alzheimer's disease. So that said, lots of data was actually done in the 90s. This is all, we have some old data um, and some new data actually looking at brain changes like like actual proof of concept, the brain is different when you are on estrogen first and you have decreased beta amyloid plaques, if I'm saying that properly, if you're taking estrogen. So proof of concept of why it works, because somebody could argue, well, the women who are taking estrogen are just more educated and just more health conscious, and that in and of itself can decrease your risk for Alzheimer's, right? Fair, fair. But with actually looking at brain changes and being like, yeah, but estrogen actually decreases the beta... Uh, or the plaques in the brain, you're like, yeah, that that is something special that estrogen does, not just that these women are somehow different than the women who don't take hormones. So the FDA approved an Alzheimer's drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's, um, and that is on the order of $26,000 a year. Doesn't cure it. Got to keep taking the drug. And it works... Um, it works in about 22 or 25% of people who take the drug, right? That was the that was the improvement in Alzheimer's. In like, it was either 26% improvement or it improved it in 26%. Regardless, it's not groundbreaking. It's not earth shattering. It's IV and it has the side effects of like cerebral hemorrhage and edema. This is a high risk drug, you guys. That's what's getting FDA approved for Alzheimer's. Several different data, several different papers on this. So this is an average, but from what we can tell, taking hormone replacement therapy with estrogen decreases your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 30%. There is no other drug that does that. There's one other thing that can do that. It's called exercise. Exercise, 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 you guys. Um, it's very, it decreases your risk of Parkinson's, decreases your risk of Alzheimer's. Exercise is awesome. But estrogen also, estrogen is cheap and it decreases your risk. So it prevents all, we have FDA approved drugs that um, don't cure it, only improve it by a little bit. But, but the point being with number eight is the FDA is not helping us. The estrogen is not gonna get FDA approved for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. Don't hold your breath. But you have to like, realize when you make the decision, should I take hormones or not? Again, are we scared of the wrong thing, right? We're so scared of estrogen. We don't pay attention to what it helps us with. 30% decrease reduction in Alzheimer's disease, which is incurable, deadly, and one might argue very costly to society. So there's an article. This is an old article. And I wanted to talk about this old article because we had this data and then like all of the benefits of estrogen got erased by the Women's Health Initiative. This paper is from 1994. It's called Estrogen Deficiency and Risk of Alzheimer's Disease in Women. So it's a cohort study um, looking at uh, almost 9,000 female residents in a retirement community in Southern California. And what they did was they, they case matched them to people on estrogen, people uh, um, on, not on estrogen. The risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia was less in estrogen users relative to non-users, odds ratio of 0.69, so 30% decreased risk of Alzheimer's. The risk decreased significantly with increasing estrogen dose and with increasing duration of estrogen use. So there you go. 
This study suggests that the increased incidence of Alzheimer's disease in older women may be due to estrogen deficiency and that estrogen replacement therapy may be useful for preventing or delaying the onset of this dementia. And I think this Alzheimer's disease, you know, data on estrogen, because it's making its rounds on social media right now, like estrogen decreases risk of cardiovascular disease, decreases risk of diabetes, decreases risk of insulin resistance, all these things that estrogen does. But I'm like, people, estrogen, or sorry, heart disease is the number one killer of all humans in America. But like, we don't care about it enough, but we do care about Alzheimer's disease. And the point being, I'm seeing a shift in the conversation around hormones because of this data reemerging. There's just a big uh, study at the end of 2022, again, looking at the role of estrogen, decreasing the plaques in the brain. But we have old data, it just got erased. It got erased with the estrogen causes cancer scare of 2001. So. We are here to say the FDA is probably not going to approve estrogen for any of this, but we've got to educate ourselves and realize why and realize um, sometimes we have to take all the data and make the best decision for us and our bodies and our family. And education is the way to do it. So I am not telling people to go on estrogen because they should decrease your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 30%. I'm not saying that. I'm saying being on hormones is a very personalized decision. But for the people who want to be on hormones, there's good data to say it's incredibly safe and likely will improve your, your health overall. Um, whenever I say stuff like that, women say, like the, inevitably the people who come and respond to this stuff like this is the people who say like, but what about the people who can't? And my answer is, I don't know about the people who can't because I don't do the studies. We need studies on hormones after breast cancer. We need studies on hormones, you know, for the people who can't, but the majority of women can, and the majority of those women are not on hormones. So I'm speaking to this big, big majority as well. Um, and I hear you people who can't, I hear you. I just don't have answers for you, for you yet. Send me all the data. I love reading it. I love putting it on the podcast. So that is 32 minutes of my eight things I wish you knew about hormones. Brought to you by my interest in sex, because that's how I got into hormones in the first place. But you treat a woman's menopause symptoms, and you give her a partner, and she has a better sex life. Top two things that help after in perimenopause and postmenopause is treatment of menopause symptoms and, and availability of partner. That's what predicts if a woman has an active sex life. So you go. You're not broken. Um, I love you guys all. Those are your eight myths. What other myths should, what should what came up for you that I didn't even mention? Um, prob here, bonus myth number nine is that there's such a thing as balancing your hormones. That's bullshit. Anytime, anytime you see um, bioidentical, which is just a marketing term, and balancing your hormones. You should never be balanced when you're having periods because otherwise you wouldn't have periods and you couldn't get pregnant and you couldn't sustain a pregnancy. There's no such thing as balanced. And then postmenopause, you have no hormones. So I guess if zero means balanced, right? There you go. I think it's good intentioned. Like stress is cortisol. Is, it's not great to live with so much cortisol in your body um, and having an unhealthy body can lower your, but all this like dominance shit again they're probably trying to sell you something there i said it <laughs> they're probably trying to sell you something um overall if you take all that and you digest it and you say i i I'm, i want to try to be as healthy with my body as i can i want to exercise i want to sleep i want to decrease my cortisol i want to eat as healthy as i can i want to not put toxins in my body such as drugs and alcohol um those are all very good for your body but to say it's going to balance you. Um, life is a series of imbalances. So live your best life. But I would say if that, that would be my number nine is like could the cringiness when people like tell you about dominance and balancing and bioidentical. All of it's all of it's cringy to me. So that's why you like me though, right? Because I because I want you to understand science and how the body works and how to best optimize yourself without buying shit.
<laughs> except for my book buy my book buy my book for your friends there you go all right guys i love you so much happy january 2023 and uh happy sex happy hormones happy life happy sleep happy exercise happy friendships i love you guys so much i'll see you next time on this awesome podcast you are not broken oh if you like this go give me some stars go give me a review share it get it up the apple ranks other women need to know I get here over and over again. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Trust me? I don't know. It seems reasonable. I like to read papers and talk about sex and hormones. So pay me back. Put me up through the ranks. Share this with more women. God bless you. I love you all. I'll see you next time.